What's up guys, Robitech here, and today we are gonna be building the most epic Ryzen 7600 step-by-step -step guide. I partnered with Andy the Lab, my friend Deb. We wanted to make the easiest, most cinematically awesome build guide for you to follow, and I can't think of a better person to do this with. So, this is the last part she needs, Ryzen 7600X. Hey Deb, catch. So today we're gonna to go through the build step by step together, but first let's run through the components. This is an AMD build and we have the latest generation Ryzen 5 7600X CPU. Six cores, 12 threads with a performance core clock of 4.7 gigahertz and 32 megabytes of L3 cache memory. Now to cool this CPU, we are going to use Deepcool's Castle 360 AIO with RGB. And for those just learning, this is what we call an all-in-one liquid CPU cooler. For our motherboard, we're using MSI's MAG B650 Tomahawk Wi-Fi, which we will install two 8 gigabyte sticks of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 RAM with RGB for a total of 16 gigabytes running at 6,000 mega transfers per second. And remember, when building with AMD, make sure your RAM is AMD Expo ready. And for storage, we'll be using the SN770 one terabyte NVMe SSD from Western Digital Black. For our GPU, we are using Gigabyte's AMD Radeon RX 6650 XT. The power supply is the Legion GX Pro from Superflower. It's an 80 plus gold, 750 watt semi-modular power supply. And to give our PC a little bit of color, we are going to be using red cable extensions from Asia Horse. And all of this is going into the Fantex Eclipse G360A, which is an ATX mid-tower case. Now the next thing we need to do is gather some additional supplies, one being a number two Phillips head screwdriver. This essentially is the only tool we're really gonna need for this build. Now you may find with some other components that you need a different size Phillips head or a completely different head, but for today, this will do the trick. You also want a handful of zip ties because when it comes to cable management, these are going to be your best friend. Also, depending on the PSU or even motherboard, sometimes you'll find Velcro cable ties, which is always nice to have. It's also nice to have some isopropyl alcohol on standby. You don't need this much, but in case you need to clean off your CPU, or the cold plate on your AIO, this will do the trick, along with some paper towels. Additionally, you're gonna want some thermal paste, and we recommend using this one, Noctua's NTH1. It's a great option, and it's easy to spread. Also, this right here is a magnetic mat, totally not necessary, but if you have one, it is a great way to organize your screws. Speaking of screws, we're gonna find a lot of screws, so it's gonna be very important that we open up one component at a time. We don't wanna mix everything up. So having a nice, clean, organized space is essential. And when it comes to static, I know there's sometimes a lot of questions and concerns. As long as you are not building on a big fuzzy carpet and wearing fluffy socks, you really shouldn't need an anti-static bracelet. Just make sure again that you have a nice, clean surface. Or if you wanted to, you could even purchase a build mat and if you're a fan of Roby Tech, let me tell you, he has probably one of the nicest build mats I have ever seen. Check out the thickness of this mat, and it's available right there at Newegg.com. It's time for the fun part. Let's start building. Now to kick things off, we're going to start with our motherboard and our CPU. The other thing you're gonna need is the motherboard manual. Now, this particular board comes with a quick installation guide, and while you might find this helpful, we're gonna go to the website and download the actual manual because you are going to find that this is going to be very helpful throughout the build, and we're gonna actually refer to it a lot. So the way you do it is you're gonna to go to the MSI website, you're gonna type in your motherboard model, find the manual, download just like this, and then we're ready to go. So we have our CPU and this is where it's gonna go right here. Actually, this black cover is gonna pop off and our CPU is gonna go right underneath that. Now this particular CPU is super exciting because it's a brand new CPU that launched just recently back in September. This is part of AMD's Ryzen 7000 series. So when you handle a CPU, you wanna be delicate with it and you don't wanna to touch the back. So you wanna just hold it around the edges like this. Now, unlike prior AMD CPUs, there are no pins on the back. Earlier generations, the pins would be on the back of the CPU. 
This is called an LGA socket, a land grid array. So if you bend a pin, you're gonna be working with the motherboard manufacturer, not AMD, which is kind of interesting. Either way, you wanna be very careful. And it's just a few simple steps to get this in place. So you're going to pop open this latch. So you're gonna push down and then lift it up and then you're going to pop open the top of the socket like so. So you're gonna notice a triangle right here on the socket and there's also a triangle right here on the CPU. So you wanna make sure that you're going to match up the triangle. In this case, it's in the top left corner. So you're gonna gently place it down. Then you're going to reverse the steps that you started. So you're gonna place this down, and then bring the lever all the way back into the lock position. And you're gonna feel a little bit of tension as you pull the lever back in place. And once your lever is locked in place, this plastic piece will pop off. Don't worry, nothing broke, that's totally normal, and your beautiful CPU is revealed. I also recommend saving the plastic that came with your CPU and over the socket. If you ever need to send your CPU back or you need to store your CPU, you have that, along with the plastic that came in the socket. Let's say you have something wrong with your motherboard, you can cover the socket up. This is a good way to protect those pins. So next up, we are going to install our NVMe SSD. Now when you look at the board, there are three M.2 slots. That's the name of the slot that we will be installing this in. Here is where we're gonna reference the manual. We are going to install this into M.2 slot one which is the closest to the CPU. You don't wanna just pick any slot because some M.2 and PCIe lanes share bandwidth. So for example, the bottom PCIe slot right here and the third M.2 slot right there share bandwidth. We wouldn't wanna install both of those components in those places. So now you're gonna need your screwdriver. Unscrew both of these screws and remove this cover, which is called a heat sink. If you look across, there's a little notch right here. You're gonna match that up with the notch on the board. You're gonna slightly put it in on an incline and you're gonna push. Take your finger and lower it down and then you're gonna turn this nifty little M.2 locker to secure it in place. You don't even need a screwdriver. So on the back of this piece that you removed is a thermal pad with a piece of plastic. So make sure you peel the plastic off before you put this heat sink back on. So you're gonna peel it off, and then you're gonna put the heat sink back in place, match up the screw holes, and screw it in. Next up, we have two sticks of RAM that we have to slot into the dims. Now, there are four dim slots, but we only have two sticks. So this is where we're gonna reference our manual, just to make sure that we're putting them in the right spot. But I also wanted to point out on the motherboard, it tells you exactly where we should be putting these two sticks. DIM A2, which is the second slot right here from the CPU, and then DIM B2, which is right here. This is like the slot furthest away from the CPU. Now, as you can see on this board, there are clips on both ends. Sometimes there's only a clip on one end. So we're gonna have to hear a double click to make sure that both ends are fully seated. Both ends are fully in place. Before you slot your RAM in, make sure you open up the clip. So you're gonna just pull it back. You're going to line it up and then you're gonna push one side down first and then the other side. And remember, this is DDR5 RAM. This B650 board will only fit DDR5 RAM. CPU, NVMe, RAM, all in place. There's one thing left we're gonna do before we get this into the PC case, and that's to take off these plastic brackets, and then we're gonna replace them with standoffs that we find in our AIO box. This is currently holding the backplate in place, which we need for our AIO. This backplate is already compatible with AMD. If we were doing an Intel build, we would actually have to swap that off and replace it with this back plate, but we don't have to do this. This is AMD. So what we do is we unscrew this plastic bracket. You just take these four standoffs and you screw them directly into the back plate. I'm getting super excited. I hope you are too, because now we can actually get the motherboard inside the case. But first, we're gonna take apart the panels, and while we do so, let's put this in a safe place. A good spot is the motherboard box. So we're gonna rest you there while we work on deconstructing our case. All right, so first, we're gonna take off the glass panel. Also, quick tip, there's a magnetic filter on the top of this case. Just slap it on this metal panel so that you don't lose it in the process. 
Now I like to store these in a safe spot just so nothing gets broken or lost, especially these thumb screws. I usually like to put it in the box that the case came in while I'm building. Now the next step is not necessary, but I'm gonna remove this cage. It's for a hard disk drive, an HDD, which is pretty rare unless you have maybe something from a long time ago that you keep dragging into new builds with you. And now you'll have all this extra space for your PSU cables. I'm also gonna remove these 2.5 inch SSD holders. Again, not necessary, but I just like how clean it makes the case. Now that we've deconstructed our case, we're gonna gently rest it down, make sure you're not crushing any cables. And now we're gonna install our motherboard. As you can see, there are nine standoffs. The motherboard is going to lay directly on these standoffs. So you need to find the box that came with the case, open it up, there's a bag of screws, locate the motherboard screws, they look like this, and we need nine of them. So we're gonna place the motherboard down onto the standoffs, and then we use nine screws to secure it in place. Don't tighten them all at once, you're gonna go around and tighten a little bit at a time, and you wanna make sure you don't over torque. It's actually kind of easy to strip a standoff, and they don't really give you many extras. Actually, they only just give you one. And there we go, this looks so good. Now we're gonna start working on our case cables. So I'm gonna show you all the cables in the back of this case, and I'm gonna help you plug them into every spot on the motherboard. But first, we're gonna start with this cable, the USB 3.0 and you have to be really careful plugging this in because it's very easy to bend the pins. Trust me, I've done it before and if you bend them enough, you're not gonna be able to get the cable to go in, you might even break it, and then that means the USB port on your case won't work. So we definitely don't want that to happen. I find it's easiest if you bring it up from the second hole from the bottom and then gently slot it in. And then every time you snake a cable from the back, you wanna think about where it is on the board that way you route it in the most efficient pattern. So our power switch is next, and then it goes right down here on the board. Sometimes on other cases, you'll find this power switch with a bunch of other things like LED plus, minus, and reset. But in this case, it's just a power switch, so it goes right there. Then we have HD audio, and it's gonna go right down here. And so far, pretty much on every board that I've built on, which has primarily been ROG and Tough Gaming, the HD audio has been on the bottom left, and it's the same case with this board. We also have an ARGB header that looks like this, and that is gonna go right up top here. It's not the same as RGB, it's ARGB. It has three prongs, not four, so you just wanna make sure you don't mix that up. And there's two on this board, so for now we're gonna use the top one, and in a little bit, after we get the AIO in place, we're gonna access the one on the bottom. So sometimes you actually have to get splitters because you have way more than, than the board actually has. But in this case, we're gonna, be, we're gonna be just fine and we don't need to buy any extra cables. We also have three fan cables from the front fans that we're gonna connect to individual fan headers on this motherboard. Now, you could connect these all to a splitter so you only had one connection, but I wanted to show you how you could do this without having to buy anything extra. So these three fan headers are going to power the front three fans. Then right here is a SATA cable, and we will attach this directly to a power supply cable in a little bit. We will also be connecting to these fan headers right here. One is gonna be for the AIO pump, and then one is gonna be for the fans that are on the radiator up top, but we'll get to that very soon. Cable extensions, a great way to bring a little color and style to your PC. You can get these for just under 30 bucks, and you may or may not know, I'm a little famous for using cable extensions. So a quick test. <laughs> these extensions are universal, and they attach to our power supply cables. This is just an option, you don't need to purchase this, but it is a fun way to make your PC look a little bit more special. I love how it comes with two different options for cable combs. I decided to go with the translucent ones, and as you can see, they're able to maintain a nice rigid shape, which is gonna help make the inside of your PC just look so clean. Now for this build, we need a 24 pin motherboard connection. We need two four x four EPS cables. EPS is another way for saying CPU. And we need one eight pin GPU cable. These extensions only have one CPU cable. So what that means is we're gonna have to take a cable from our power supply to complete the set. 
Now you could buy a single CPU extension, but I don't think it's necessary because once we put that radiator on our AIO in place, those two top cables are essentially going to be hidden. The real pizzazz is gonna come from the 24 pin and then the cable that we use for our GPU. So let's plug in our 24 pin and our eight pin connections at the top. Now it's time to open this AIO, our all-in-one liquid CPU cooler. Inside the box, you will find a 360 millimeter radiator, three 120 millimeter fans, plus some cables, which we'll go over in a second, and hardware. This is where you need to look at the manual to make sure you're picking the right stuff for your build. We're doing AMD, so anything that's for Intel, we don't need. Now, whether you have an AM4, the prior generation, or an AM5, like we have here, this CPU cooler will work. It's cross-compatible. So, if you have this on an older setup and you're upgrading, there's no need to buy a new one it will still work. This is what we're gonna need for AMD, and I already organized it for you to see. So the first thing we're gonna do is mount these three fans to the radiator. But before we do that, we have to think about a few things. One, we wanna make sure that we don't connect our fans so that the cables are dangling in the front. That would not look so nice. So we're gonna to wanna to make sure we rotate the fan so that the cables are easily accessible in the rear. The other thing we need to think about is how do we mount them? Which orientation? You will see both, and that is a whole nother series on itself. We could talk about cooling and radiator and fan placement and all that stuff. For the purpose of this video, we're gonna mount our fans in an exhaust position. So we're gonna put our fans like this, whereas the fans in the front are intake. It's pushing air in. And the way that you know that is, if you were to follow the curve of the fan all the way to the tip, it goes in more. So the, the direction of airflow is going through the fan. Now, again, we can go into a ton of details on that, but for the purpose of this tutorial, we're just gonna focus on the how to build steps. So next, you're gonna take your long screws, and these are gonna go through the fan like that and then they connect directly onto the radiator. And there's four on each fan. So you're gonna go across and do all 12. Now you can also mount an AIO on the front, but we are doing a top mounted AIO. So this is essentially how it's gonna get mounted inside the case. But before we can do that, we have to attach a special bracket on this cold plate. So you're gonna grab these two brackets and the little baby screws, and you're gonna attach them to each side of this pump. Now you wanna be careful when you're mounting this bracket because you don't wanna to touch the thermal paste. The cover, unfortunately, will not stay on once the brackets are in place. So at this point, you have to just be extra careful. So if you touch the thermal paste and it gets all over you, don't freak out, just wash your hands. But then you're gonna need isopropyl alcohol, like an alcohol swab to clean the cold plate. And then that means you're gonna have to buy thermal paste and put some paste on your CPU before you put your pump down. But you don't have to. Technically, the pre-applied thermal paste is totally fine and it will save you some extra bucks if you don't have to buy paste. Now, just so you know, once we get this radiator up top, it is snug. So we're not gonna be able to fit our fingers back there to plug anything in. So at this point in the build, it is imperative that anything that you need to plug on the top of your motherboard gets done now, or you're gonna end up having to take the radiator out to plug in anything that you might have forgotten. But we're not gonna forget, because we're doing this together, right? Now let's take a quick look at the AIO manual. You're gonna see there's two cables coming from the pump. We have a little hub where all three fans from the AIO are gonna get connected to, and the opposite end right here, this has to go into one of the fan headers on the board. So we're gonna snake this from the back. Wiggle, wiggle. Get that in place. It's gonna go right there. Then on the pump, there's another fan header and that's gonna go right here. Pump fan one. As you can see from the manual, this RGB hub is also going to be attached to all of these fans, but it also gets attached directly to this pump. Before you get the radiator in place, you have to get this RGB cable routed to the back or you will never be able to access it. So to recap, we have six cables, three fan, three RGB, plus the RGB cable on the pump that all have to get routed to the back. If you have an extra set of hands, it might be helpful having someone hold the radiator while you work on the cables but you can definitely do it on your own. And now once your cables look like this, we're gonna move the PC case to its side and really get that radiator locked into position. Oh, 
Okay, so as you can see, <laughs> I'm running into a little bit of an issue because I can't get the radiator to fit up top. I know dimensionally it works, but the front fans are in the way. It's too snug. So here's what we're gonna do. Remove the entire front bracket that holds all three front fans. And now we have a lot of room to work. Next, you will take these 12 radiator screws to secure the rad to the top of the case. So then we just pop this front bracket into place, screw it back on once the rad is secured. Then you will place the pump directly on top of the CPU. If you're using your own thermal paste, just remember to apply it to the CPU first. Use these thumb screws to secure it in place, tighten all four evenly a bit at a time. Then we will take all three fan cables and plug them into the hub we already attached to the fan header on the motherboard. And just a reminder, this is what the hub looked like. Then we will take this RGB hub. The cable that we already snaked to the back that's attached to the pump, the RGB cable, that goes right here where it says out. Then take the RGB cables from the fan and attach them directly to this hub starting with number one. Then you will find an ARGB extension cable in the AIO box. This is what you are going to connect to the hub and then once it's connected, snake it underneath and attach it right here on the bottom of the motherboard to the ARGB header. And congratulations, because this is officially the last cable we will attach to our motherboard. We are getting there, we are almost done. Next step is to install our GPU. This is the AMD Radeon RX 6650 XT, and we are going to slot it right here. You see that? That is called a PCIe lane. But before we can slot it in, we have to take off some metal brackets. So first you're gonna remove this outer piece, and then you're gonna remove the second and the third bracket. So not the top one, the second and the third. Before you slot the card in, you wanna make sure that the latch is open. So when it's up, it's closed. When it's pushed back towards the board, it's open. So make sure that's open. You're gonna to wanna to pull off this plastic tab, then line up the bottom notch on the GPU to the notch on the PCIe lane, and gently push the GPU into place and that latch will pop up. That's how you know it's seated all the way. Now this GPU is not very heavy, so you can technically take your hand off. It's not gonna fall, but I still recommend that you support it with your hand while you put these thumb screws back in. At least get one of them in before you kind of let go. Then this outer bracket goes back into place. For this particular GPU, it's just one eight pin PCIe connection. This is the GPU cable extension that we prepped earlier. We're gonna slide this under into the open slot. And then it connects right here. We are almost done. The last thing left is our power supply. So we're gonna slot it into this open space here. Now remember, we had to take one of the stock cables that came with the power supply for our CPU because we didn't have enough extensions. Now I suggest connecting it now before you put your power supply in your case. You can still access it, but it will just be a little bit more challenging. As you can see, there's a fan right here that is going to be installed facing the table. The fan on this PSU is intake, so we wanna face the fan toward the direction of the holes on the case so we can pull air in. So this direction, not this direction. So you're gonna slide your power supply into the bottom of your case and make sure all of your cables, your GPU extension is not in the way, and it should go in pretty smoothly. We are going to match the ends of our power supply cable to our cable extensions. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Oh, and quick tip, your VGA cable, the cable for your GPU, you're gonna see it has a little extra connection here. Don't use that one. Use the one that is directly coming from the main power supply cable. Get you in there, click our SATA, and then we have our other CPU cable, and it clicks in like that. And lastly, you're gonna attach the four screws that came with your PSU, and use that to attach the PSU to your case. Now we just have to do a little cable management, add some zip ties, and hopefully we pass Robitech's cable management standards. Now we're gonna put our panels back on, the middle one just slots right in, tightens with your two thumb screws, then we're gonna pop on the front panel, and don't forget to add the magnetic dust filter on the top. And just so you know, there's also a little dust filter underneath the power supply that slots in and out. This looks so good. We're almost ready to power it on. Let's not forget though about this peel. We got a nice peel right here on our AIO. And don't forget about those two peels on the glass panel. 
I'm gonna leave that off for now because it is time to power this baby on and I want you to really see it. So inside your PSU box, you will find one more cable, your power cable. You're gonna plug it in to your PSU and then plug this into the wall. Then we flick on the power supply and then right up front, there is a power button. Dim the lights in three, two, one. Woohoo! Look at that! Oh yeah! And sometimes it can take a while for the system to show anything on the screen or it might even restart a few times, so don't be alarmed. I hope you found this build tutorial helpful. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. Leave your comments down below. And with that said, I'm gonna kick things back to Justin. We now have a showcase budget system, and thanks to Andy, you now have probably one of the best, clearest, most visually stunning step-by-step -step guides you've probably ever seen. And so you chat it to her, but now the question is, you're interested in doing this PC build, how does it actually perform? Which at idle, you're sitting at 42, and under load, you have a very nice and very manageable 86. So you've got overclock headroom uh, in the 7600X if you want to. And then in terms of upgrading, if you wanted to go to something even higher, then you know you've actually got some room there, and this case is giving you plenty of airflow to keep that beautiful deep cool AIO nice and fed. Now when gaming, which is probably the number you care about the most, you're looking at a very very nice and frosty 53. Now again, that 86 is when it's like heavily under load. And again, the number that you care about is when at gaming, you're only looking at 53. So what about the GP Roby? Well, it's equally as awesome. You're looking at 33 at idle and a meager 59 when you're under load. So, and also when gaming, you're looking at 59, given that gaming is obviously a heavy GPU load. So again, there's not as much of a gap there as there is in CPU. What this essentially means is that your temps for both your GPU and CPU both have room for overclocking. So even if you want to get more out of this, your 6650 or your uh, 7600X, you could completely do that with zero issues here. Uh, and both the AIO and obviously the airflow from these fans are going to be more than good enough to make sure that you have really good solid performance out of those two components. Components. Well, that's awesome, and our temps are good, Roby. What about performance in games? Because, yeah, great, your temps are good, but that doesn't actually tell me how well it does in games. Well, given it's a 6650 XT, it's a great card for 1440p, and even more so than 1080p. So kicking this off, let's talk about Cyberpunk 2077. This is using ray tracing and ultra at 1440p, and again, we're using FSR 2.1 set to ultra performance and you're looking at a nice and solid 52.96 FPS, which is great. So you can definitely play with some of those numbers, potentially turning down on ray tracing, et cetera, to get a solid 60 the entire time through with zero issues whatsoever. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, again, setting XESS to performance, which again, remember XESS is card agnostic, so it works on anything. But again, setting that to performance, the highest graphical preset that you can set in Tomb Raider, you're looking at 111 frames per second. For Forza Horizon 5, again, 1440p, FSR set to ultra performance and extreme preset set, you're looking at 62 FPS, which is great for racing games. 62 is great. You could play with some of those settings and even give it a little bit more headroom if you really wanted to make sure you had no problems keeping a solid 60 the entire time. Now, finally, rounding out the single player experience is Tiny Tina's Wonderland with highest graphical preset and FSR set to performant. You are only looking at a, you know, 116.63 frames per second. So if you want to get 120 FPS, hey, you can just set a couple of those settings but that game looks really good. That game's good at 60, so 116 is more than good enough. Okay, Roby, well, those are great single-player cinematic type games. What about your multiplayer games, Roby? Because that's what everybody plays. We're all about competitive. Well, this thing is actually a beast at 1440p competitive gaming, and even more so at 1080p. First, let's kick it off with Apex Legends. Setting it for competitive settings, which means low visual settings, maximizing frame rate, you're sitting at 247 FPS. For Valorant, again, competitive, Maximizing frame per second, you're looking at 638 FPS. I heard the game's unplayable at 500, at anything less than 550. That is a complete joke. Point is, you get a lot of frames per second, you got nothing to worry about there. Finally, you got Fortnite. Again, low visual settings, maximizing again for competitive play. There's none of that new, brand new Unreal 5.1 stuff, which is beautiful, by the way. But if you're just playing competitive Fortnite, you're looking at 352 frames per second. Performance on games. 
fantastic. Performance on thermals, fantastic. Now you might be looking at this and thinking, Roby, you know, is this, is this like the best build I can build in this case? Like if I have a little bit more money, what could I do to help improve performance? Well, the best thing about this is that on this platform, specifically for AMD, AMD is supposed to support this platform, meaning uh, the motherboard and everything else through 2025. So the CPU upgrade on this will be absolutely an option for a while, but I will say, the 7600X is a completely capable CPU for any level of gaming, whether you wanted to turn this into a 4K gaming machine or you wanted to leave it right where it is at either 1080p and 1440p. For your best gaming performance, GPU is going to be the best bet. And if you wanted to not mess with the PSU, so you wanted all the systems you want to say, well, I want to go up to the best GPU for this, uh, for this current system, then the 6700 XT uh, or the 6750 is going to be your best bet. Now, I will say, there is a super flower version of the 850 watt. So if you're building this and following along, it's actually the exact same setup as what Deb showed during her installation, etc. But if you wanted to add, go up to 850 watts and still follow those, then all of a sudden at that point in time, you can basically do any uh, GPU up to a 7950 XTX. Now, if you're thinking I wanna throw like a 4090 or a 4080 or something like that in, uh, then more than likely you're gonna wanna go to the 1000 watt version. That's gonna be a little bit different. Uh, that does fit in this case. And the other thing too that's really good about this case is that most of those GPUs will fit, especially in the FE side. So if you're looking at the 4090 Founders Edition, 4080 Founders Edition, things like the PNY, those are going to fit as well. 7900 XTXs or the 7900 XTs, if you go to an 850 watt, are gonna fit in here great. And then all of a sudden this becomes a 4K graphical powerhouse. Also jumping up to 32 gigs over 16 gigs is gonna be a good idea if you can spend the extra 40 to $50 if you want to. The cost of DDR5 has come down quite a bit. Uh, and the good thing is, so going to 32 gigs and purchasing that, the, again, installation is exactly the same. So if you want to purchase those and then go into the guide and follow step-by-step, step, you're gonna have no issue, nor are you gonna be lost. Now, the last thing is, the good thing is that the case the AIO, the MOBO, and SSD are gonna be more than good to go. They're, they're gonna work perfectly fine. There's no need to necessarily upgrade those. Now, if you wanted to add additional storage, again, you could just go in, purchase an additional NVMe SSD. There are more slots on the motherboard. Should you wanna do it, and then you can just follow the exact same instructions that she showed to uh, install that in just a second slot. So getting a two terabyte or even one of those incredible four terabyte crucial drives, uh, you could absolutely do that. Now, if you want to, we do have a list of upgrades down below. So for that, that PSU, um, for potential GPU upgrades, for potential second uh, NVMe SSDs, all that sort of stuff, you absolutely could with no problem whatsoever. Now, I did wanna mention, if you are going to do uh, an additional CPU, like you're gonna go up to like a 7700 or 7900 or a 7950. You definitely wanna add a rear exhaust fan, which is very, very easy to add um, in terms of connectivity and stuff like that. So you're gonna to wanna to add that rear exhaust fan. Uh, temps are fine with it as it is now, but you're, when you're gonna jump up and you're just generating that much more heat, you definitely wanna get more of that heat outside of the case. Anyway, guys, that is it for this video. I hope that you have seen one of the cleanest, most just no-brainer guides with all of the visual tricks and visually just treats that you could have for having a step-by-step -step guide. And again, huge shout out to Andy the Lab slash Deb for helping us make this video and make something so awesome. I would love to get your feedback down below. Number one, was everything clear? Was there something that we did during the installation or that Deb did during the installation that wasn't necessarily clear and you'd like to see more clarity on? Do you think that us having the performance data and the benchmarks and stuff, was that useful? And does this help you choose parts and do you feel more confident even with your upgrade path given what we showed in today's video? Now, if you finish this build, please make sure you tag at Robitech on Twitter so we can share in the joy of you completing your build. That would be absolutely amazing. Anyway, let us know all that and more down in the comments below. Now, while you're down there, make sure you slap that subscribe button with that like button and ring that notification bell so you get a notification each and every time we post a new video like this or a step-by-step -step like this uh, up on YouTube. Now, also, we do builds like this live. So if you wanna see this budget build, a lot of times we'll end up, this will probably be something we'll do live as well. So if you wanna follow along, ask questions, head on over to youtube.com slash Robitech Live, where we do builds like this, as well as benchmarking and all that sort of stuff. Or if YouTube's not your thing for live, head on over to twitch.tv slash Robitech, where you can also watch it there. Also, you should join our Discord server, discord.gg slash Robitech, because as you're talking about troubleshooting, as you're talking about parts, as you're talking about any of that stuff, we have tens of thousands of people who are part of that community who love to talk about those very same things. And hey, you know what? You, you, you never know, you might actually make a friend. Also, you should follow us on all the other socials. Uh, we're at Robitech everywhere where you can see awesome things like 
when we basically built a PC in a Ford Lightning and then powered the whole thing like this. Or maybe just one of these fire builds we had over on Instagram. You can also follow at Andy the Lab as well. And she also covers cars. So if you want to see some super hot car action, uh, follow there. Anyway, guys, that is it for this video. We super enjoyed making it. We hope you enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you on the next one.